Bless God and greetings. Right now I'm going to do this topic on a few of the more, you would say, mysterious teachings, at least at a whole, in the scriptures surrounding this relationship, if you will, between the wicked and the righteous at different parts of eschatology and as well some of those things that are actually happening right now what some would call on the other side okay so I'm going to talk about the great gulf and as well I'm going to be talking about those that are within the city and without the city and that would be more of what I mentioned prior about eschatology and how we're going to be moving into the new heavens and new earth and the Father coming down here after Jesus reigns a thousand years, okay? There is mysterious elements to this, okay? We don't find ourselves with a multitude of scriptures on these topics, but we do have some scriptures. And my point of this video is as well to speak about the necessity of how we approach dealing with our enemies, okay? And make no mistake about this, that the Bible teaches that you hate your enemies and you love your enemies. If you think that is insane, it's because you don't know God and you lack the common sense of Bible reading and appropriate mindset that you would see and feel and understand when you're reading about the God of the Bible and how he judges because God must be doing both of these simultaneously. Okay. And how that works is not by anyone who has a carnal mind, who's of the flesh, who will speak for God unjustly. And that will absolutely never be. And we will never allow that in the house of God. God on a personal level has nothing to do with sinners. In fact, there are many sinners actually being tormented right now. He's taken it to another level that you think that you're without God for your sins and you are, although you might be deceived. Uh, it gets worse. Okay. There's something worse that can happen. Okay. And there's many souls dealing with that right now. And that's inevitable for you. We have to speak about inevitability because your damnation does not slumber in this specific, you know, someone who's a false teacher. But all those that follow them also fall into the same pit, the same ditch. So make no mistake about it. There's something worse coming to you. And right now the wrath of God abides on you. You know, the famous chapter of John 3, it's so misunderstood. It's sickening to be quite honest with you if you do not obey if you do not believe the son of god the wrath of god abides on you and that's what we need to tell people okay you're never going to get a real repentance out of people without the fear of god because it's the fear of god that's the beginning of wisdom the fear of god opens up to all sin so without the fear of God, you're not going to have a biblical repentance. Now, God in his love and these people breathing, and some people may hear this and be appalled by things that I say, but that's going to be your fault, and you can take that up with Jesus because I'm going to be going by what the Bible says. God's obviously showing you love, okay? The saints of God and the true saints of God continuously showed love, but they never gave their heart to a sinner. The Bible says, my son, give me your heart. Okay. I kept you away even in cases from a wicked, filthy woman. No man can serve two masters. Okay. Now, I want to speak about something in my own life to show that we have to see these teachings and it has to train us for what's coming. And we have to, in life, 
have this produced. You have to have the fruit of this, okay? Because it's imperative. And this is where you get into umbilical hate. People render evil for evil, and then they just go the way of the devil and, you know, go to a devil's hell, okay? You have to be satisfied in how the Lord does his judgment, okay? We already talked about the spiritual condemnation that is on these people. But now we're talking about when God has enough of someone in the flesh. He has had enough. And the way it's worded in the Bible is their iniquities have come to a full. Okay. God knows this time. Okay. And it's in his determination. And that's it for that person. That person will no more be in the land of the living. But... They're not going to cease to exist. And this might be something you haven't or have heard. Their presence is not going to be without, okay, at different times based on your life as a saint and different parameters here. And I will speak about these things. Before I get into a situation in my life, I'll speak about a conversation I had with a man that he was given to the teachings of the Messiah when it came to purity. He knew that the churches were allowing sin. And every once in a while, I run into someone like this that seems to have some agreeance with the words of Jesus. But yet, they want a hell that's merely a metaphor, okay? So the teachings about hell are just metaphorical and they're not literal. And I tried to explain to him this cannot be. And it was not in this conversation from so much of clear Bible reading because the Bible is perfectly clear about this. I'm going to talk about aspects of hell that is abundantly clear that it must be a literal place and that there's no metaphor, okay? Now, what I was talking to him is based on some things that are law, okay? Like a natural law of creation that God created you in his image. You have to exist, okay? Yes, God in his creation no Calvinism, you're to be with God forever. Now you're failing this from your youth and sinning. You reject the gospel, you do have to go somewhere. Okay, that's what God has said he'll do. Whether it's one time, a thousand times, you get to hear the gospel. God has said that, so you get that opportunity. This is where God is in pity, in mercy, okay? And now upon rejection of this, you do have to spend some time and it's eternal and it's punishment and you have to be somewhere, okay? It's just how it is. It's a law of creation, okay? God cannot undo what he has done, okay? That's just what we have to understand about a spirit, okay? When your spirit departs from your body, okay, that spirit exists somewhere, okay? We're going to talk about how he's going to do this with the body, okay? You're just going to have to exist. You cannot cease to exist. It's impossible. A demon cannot cease to exist, okay? They're a spirit. They have to exist. Animals can cease to exist, Okay? And I also talked to him because I expressed to him I'm not political. I don't care about the left or the right. But I brought to his attention that if someone raped and the person got locked up for, let's just say, a life sentence, no one really complains about that. Okay, there's nothing to complain about. You can express your rebuke against false government that is not under God in different ways. We do know that through the ordinance of God, excuse me, that God 
has ordered these principalities, if you will, and they do do work against evildoers, okay? You know, this relationship between God and them is not personal, but it's just the way God is choosing to rid away some evil until a given day. But all governments of man go to hell and all nations that are sinful go to hell, which is all nations today. You're not going to find a godly one. Okay, You'll find problems in the way they do things and it's prophecy and it's, well, just not being a stranger. We're in the time of being a stranger right now and they're not. Okay, So they've missed different things there. However, no one's going to argue with that, that a rapist is in life. Okay prison for life. Now, I said to him, what happens if he never died? And the man expressed, well, that's not a great way to live. And I said, well, yeah, you're right. He'd be in jail forever. And, you know, that's the thing is that we know that man will die. But we have to understand that God has the jurisdiction. So what if the man never died? Well, he'd be in jail forever. And so over one sin, even in our culture, and no one complains about it. And there's a reason because it doesn't bother their conscience in this case that he has to do his time. Okay. And now you're sinning against the eternal God. Okay. You have to have an eternal punishment for that. So that's how great the mercy of God is in the gospel thereof, that you have a chance to stay out of this place. Now, the Bible also teaches that the atonement that is offered in Jesus is supposed to get you from going to this place. So once you go to this place, there is no offering, okay? And that man will say, well, what if they're in hell and they repent in hell? And it's too late. I mean, God just offered no atonement there. So some could question, why doesn't God offer them a chance there? Well, you get to the point where that's not actual punishment anymore. And again, I look at this society. If they let the rapists after 10 days get out, people are going to be in an outrage. Okay. No, he's got to do life. Okay. And I agree. I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with that. I mean, so there's things that people get right in life that they get from God. They just don't honor and glorify God. Okay. And then, of course, just for the fact that there is no atonement in hell. Okay. There's no purgatory. These are all made up things. And there's no atonement there. So we see that God offering atonement in the land of the living is a great pity on sinners. Okay. So we have to see that how unnatural sin is. Until you see that, you're going to always struggle with knowing God's anger. Okay? And it's for this cause many will not come to faith. Okay? And they just won't fear God. Okay? So they'll always have a false faith and a false repentance. Now, in my life, I like to share this with you because it's one of those things that shadows something to me that I see. Because we read the Bible about different shadows and sometimes you can see them in life, you know. Because these men saw these things in life. And, you know, the way it's taught in the Bible, it figures something else to us as well as that literal account. And I've had this situation in life in the past where I've been reviled heavily. Okay, heavily reviled. And it's in close proximity. And... I'm separated from this person that's reviling me, okay? They could get at me, okay? This is real life, so it's not the very image, okay? This is in this world, in this time. And in the time to come, these things don't happen, but those possibilities. But some of the parts of this story will still, I believe, be occurring, okay? And this person is separated from me and they're reviling me, okay? Absolute mockery, okay? And saying things that are extremely false. And I'm not talking about, you know, judgment calls, okay? 
I'm just talking about saying something like I'm a neo-Nazi, which is, you know, it couldn't be any further from the truth, okay? And I teach a great damnation on all Nazis, okay? So, I mean, obviously I'm not a neo-Nazi, but, you know, you get my drift, okay? It's one thing if you think I'm a heretic or something, you know, a subjective but to call someone a neo-Nazi is just insane, unless if you actually know that they're such, okay? It's like calling someone a racist without actually having verifiable proof. I mean, it's just really wicked and it's just reviling, okay? And so I'm sitting there and then at this time that this happened, I was shielded from their view, okay? They couldn't see me where I was when they were doing this, okay? But the demon in the person was trying to rattle me. And I was sitting there thinking to myself that this is of God because he's showing me something. And he's showing me that, you know, this person and the demon, they're going to exist forever. In this state, the person has this opportunity to repent and stop. The likelihood of this is slim to none. And God is showing me that, you know, be of good cheer. You know, the Son of God has overcome. And their presence should not bother you. Even the fact that they exist, don't let it bother you because I already have peace. And greater things are coming. And you don't revile back, okay? You could rebuke them, okay? Absolutely. Because an onlooker like the deputy could be saved, okay? Absolutely. And, but it cannot take away your peace unless if you allow it, all right? And I'm getting reviled and I'm thinking to myself, you know, as well surrounding the rich man and Abraham and Lazarus that there comes a time where there is a great gulf now fixed. So there is no more possibility for this person. But that person's presence is still there. Okay. So I'm thinking to myself that I will not go to Abraham's bosom now because I'm going to start to talk about this. But saints in the past, they did go to this place of comfort. And they were that close to wicked people. And the outcomes could not change at that point, which is interesting. Because in this life, the outcomes could change. I mean, you could go the way of the devil and sin because of this person. You could hate each other in the malicious way to each other and both go to the same hell. So the outcome could change. This person could repent and be saved and start to understand how to deal with revilers. So in this world right now, the outcome could change, but the presence is there, okay? You can't escape reality, okay? This is a real thing. It's going to happen. You just have to believe what God has said about it, okay? A lot of people don't believe what Jesus was saying about Abraham and the rich man Lazarus. You know, there's cults, they don't believe it. You know, I think a lot of people don't want to believe it to maybe not take a cult right approach upon it, but they just don't want to believe it because they know they're going to a bad place. They don't have any peace. And for one reason is when they get mocked, they can't deal with it. But I see how man of God dealt with it in the Bible. They didn't want to escape reality. They just had the peace of the Son of God. Okay. So I wanted to share that about my own life that I believe God showed me something. Okay. That in a small place, you know, on one side is a reviler, on one side is a saint. At this point, when I had a hard meditation on it, I was, you know, separate from their vantage point with their eyes. 
and I was in this protection there physically and other times they might be able to see me when they're coming after their revilings and coming with the revilings. But be that as it may, I had peace about the situation. Although, you know, someone's saying these blasphemous things about God or, you know, reviling you or slandering you, there is a perfect peace, okay? And it's only going to get better, okay? So bless God for that. Now, I talked about Abraham and the time of Abraham and the time of Jesus when he said this, and I'm going to start to just talk about this a little more. The idea that has been understood by many, and I would say few reject this, and I don't know, to reject this, you get into some diverse and strange teaching, but when Jesus was teaching and speaking about this in Luke 16, he's teaching what we understand as a two compartment view of a place called Hades. Okay. It says in Psalm 16, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Okay. In this Psalm, we read about the fact that the son of God went to Hades as well. And since we're reading Psalms, it's Sheol. Okay. So when you see the English word hell, you have to go to the underlying word in the original language to diversify what we're talking about. Okay. To distinguish, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a potential place where sinners are suffering right now or a place that they're going to be in suffering after the resurrection of damnation. And as well, this part I'm talking about right now, is it a place that the saints are waiting for Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and the ascension of Jesus back to the Father? Okay, so those are the big options here. So at this time, even of the writing here of Psalm 16 and David, there were saints in the earth. Hades... Sheol is in the earth, okay? So that's why it talks about Jesus. You know, he went to the lower parts of the earth and things like this. So there's two compartments and the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor. And so a righteous man, when he died, he went to this place called Abraham's bosom, okay? And a wicked man, when he died, he went to a place of torment. But both places were in Hades. And that's why it talks about Jesus. He went to Hades. Okay. And Jesus was not tormented for three days and three nights. Okay. In hell. And the very few that say those need to repent of saying that. Okay. And we have some different Bible scriptures that do relate this. But it goes back to a point that I was speaking of is that the rich man and Abraham were actually conversing. Now, have you ever thought of that? And if you think if Abraham and the rich man, he wasn't being just by words hard to deal with. The rich man understood the reality he never asked to get out okay he was begging himself he mistreated a beggar who had physical problems and now and he's begging himself so what a man sows he does reap the situation is though what it is i mean abraham in that case could not fully escape the presence of the wicked. But in this case, spiritually, he already did that on earth, dying in faith, and he was being comforted. So he does escape that in his spirit, but he's not leaving reality. Okay. This is how God has set it up. And if this is how God has set it up, he must set this whole thing up for ways in which you can conquer. 
And it's the Son of God that has conquered death. Okay. So blessed be God. Psalm 49, verse 14. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, say law. Okay. So the word grave here is actually Sheol. You can take from this what you will. I think a few different things can be taken. But one of which is that I believe that Abraham had dominion over the situation. That Abraham was in Sheol, but he was comforted. And the Son of God, I believe, went to the place of Abraham's bosom. I do believe this. And I do believe that he proclaimed against the spirits in prison. So with God, victory is there, and there's also a proclamation of it. Okay? In Psalm 89, starting at verse 47, Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah. Lord, where are thy former loving kindnesses, which thou swearest unto David in thy truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of thy servants. How I do bear in my bosom the reproach of all the mighty people. Wherewith thine enemies have reproached, O Lord, wherewith they have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. So here we see another grave, which is Sheol, which is Hades. And I read this passage, and you can read it yourself. You might see things that are interesting. Perhaps the word bosom might appear interesting there. But... The man is speaking of the blessedness of the Lord, and there is an oath, okay, sworn unto David. If Jesus Christ left this place, he took the saints with him, and that I believe men of God knew that they would go to a place of comfort waiting for the progression of God's salvation. The Son of God being raised from the dead and as well the ascension of the Son of God which is in the book of Psalms as well and that Jesus now took these saints with him to the Father and that's why we see them worshiping there in the book of Revelation okay so now at this point Abraham doesn't have to talk to the rich man the rich man is still in the earth okay and Abraham is with God. Now, that's not the end of the story, though. Okay? That's a good part of the story, and it's a glorious thing. But there's comfort on either part there. Okay? Today you'll be with, with me in paradise. Excuse me. So, today, so the penitent thief went to a place of paradise, which is the comfort of Abraham's bosom. And now he's present with the Lamb in the throne room of heaven, if you will, the throne room and the temple above. Okay. Now, the next big thing we have is that Jesus is going to come back. Okay. And he's going to set up the kingdom here. Because if we go remember what has been sworn on to David... The progression of this is that of David's seed, we had to have one sit on David's throne. So, but we also have other scriptures that teach that this man will also be the Lamb of God. So, and for atonement. So, we know that he went to Hades, and we know he had to come out because he's got to reign on this earth. He's got to sit on David's throne. You know, like it says in Psalm 132, verse 11. So, we're seeing this progressing. And when Jesus comes back, the saints will be with him. 
and we're going to reign on this earth. So we'll still be at that point not in direct presence with the rich man or people reviling today that die in this sin. Okay. But as that happens and Jesus reigns for a thousand years, the saints are in an immortal body. So the spirit cannot cease to exist. And now God makes the body this way, spiritual too. So now you have a tripart being that is all prepared for dwelling somewhere for eternity. This is in the resurrection of just and unjust. Okay. For those to say this body is different, aren't teaching anything the Bible teaches. Okay. The Bible teaches a generic resurrection of both just and unjust when it comes to the elements. And this we read in 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. So when you see someone who's a sinner, they're using their body incorrectly, yes. But what makes them a sinner is their spirit. Okay. Because someone might be clothed modestly and you won't know that they're a sinner just by looking at them. But inwardly, they're full of wickedness and filthiness. Okay. So it's what makes you a sinner is your heart, your mind, your spirit. And it does then defile the body. Okay. But it can't always be understood by just the natural eyes. Okay. So in Daniel 12, we're going to have the resurrection of the saints when Jesus returns. And then years later, we get into the resurrection of damnation. Okay. A simple way of saying this is a thousand years later, although I will say in the book of Ezekiel, it does speak about some different things that there's a seven year period and a seventh month period. These are different things that can be talked about at a different time, but anyone just going by a base numbering out of Revelation 20 is just doing it safe. And then some of those other things from Ezekiel that are, you know, harder to be understood at this point. How do we factor in some of that timing after the Gog and Magog? That's a different subject, and it, it may or may not even bring a difference at this point in the numbering, but it certainly can. Be that as it may, Jesus will reign a thousand years, and then there's going to be this Gog and Magog, okay, in this chapter, Revelation 20. And then finally, there's a total end to the enemies of God. And even Satan is going into the lake of fire, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. But one thing we read in Daniel 12, verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame, and everlasting contempt. So, in the resurrection of unjust, there is an everlasting contempt, okay? So, however you're going to just go by Revelation 20, we're going to get to a point where all the dead, all sinners, the rich man, Judas, King Saul, they all have to be raised from the dead. So, now you're really going to know they exist, and they are existing, of course. But now you're really going to know because at the white throne judgment, there's no reason to think we, the saints, will not be with Jesus. Okay. And therefore, they're all going to be there. We're going through this Judas, you know, all these wicked people. And I was meditating one morning and I, you know, I was thinking about things in Ezekiel, you know, surrounding Gog and Magog. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, a saint needs great patience. You know, we have to grow and grow and grow and we have to allow God to keep growing us in patience. Okay. And we have to believe in the promises of God and we have to want them. And I would say, in this case, 
just desire the Father coming down, the Father of Jesus and his coming down from heaven to be here because that's what it teaches. Because there's a lot of things that we have to go through that should be a joy to us, okay? Some of them may be a little harder to understand. Some of them may be deeper. Some of them may be so different from how we're serving God in this life. But there's two things that you need to be understanding, okay? Start with the fear of God and start at just rudiments on this. Start at the basics, okay? There's two things. You need to know how to suffer and you need to know how to reign. And make no mistake, this is very important because in this life there is going to be suffering. Okay, how much of it you deal with, you just don't know until it happens. Okay, but if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. It might only be spiritual, and the spiritual actually is going to try to do the most harm to you. So be on that mind. Okay, the physical stuff obviously is not good. Okay. But you need to know how to reign because when you reign, you're going to reign on how God reigns. Okay. And God, he does have long suffering. Okay. And you got to have your mind fully set on God. Okay. Because we're going to have a falling away first. I mean, we talked about Jesus coming back. We've already got into even after the thousand year reign. A lot of people just aren't going to make it. And there's very few right now that have even made it. And the bottom line is in prophecy, you expect to lose people, okay? That's the prophecy, okay? So if you can suffer in this world and you can make it through and you're going to reign, okay, then you're going to have the patience where, well, there's a lot of wicked sinners that got to be judged. Let's patiently wait and see the Son of God do it, okay? Now, These sinners are judged and they go into the lake of fire. This we read at the end of Revelation 20. Okay. I'm going to read Isaiah 34. I'm going to read a few scriptures that. How you place them. Is up to you at this point. I'm not going to speak anything. Extremely hard about some of these things. I'm going to start to read at Isaiah 34, verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever from generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing, and thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest, and lay, and hatch, and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord, and read, No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it has commanded, and his spirit it has gathered them. 
And he has cast the lot for them, and his hand has divided it onto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Now, we're going to give you just a background of what I believe. And you can see if what I believe has any, perhaps, potential connection to what I just read. There are some things about the Battle of Armageddon and the Gog and Magog, certainly chapters in Ezekiel 38 and 39, starting Gog and Magog, but maybe as well a portion of Ezekiel talks about Armageddon. These are different possibilities. Armageddon is not Gog and Magog, okay? To make one sweeping move and make them all the same, it just doesn't agree with Revelation 19 and Revelation 20. There could be some dual fulfillments between them, but again, if you read Revelation 19 and Revelation 20, to make that all one day is impossible. It's an amillennial heresy, okay? My point is, is that my belief is that there's going to be the battle of Armageddon. Jesus is going to deal with the Antichrist, the false prophet. He's going to destroy all the nations and all the sinners. Okay, the kingdom's going to be set up. The immortal saints are going to reign with Jesus on this earth. And there are going to be mortals that go in because they repented when they saw Jesus come back with the saints. Now, in this kingdom for a thousand years, you're going to have mortals, and then the mortals are going to procreate. And there's going to be swift judgment against sin. Worship of Jesus will be mandatory. It's going to be everlasting righteousness because the saints know how to reign, okay? We've suffered with him. We shall also reign with him, bless God. And we will do this in the name of our Lord, okay? And in Jesus' name, we will do this, okay? And Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians 6. And we will do this, okay? And we shall ever be with him, bless God. And though, because there's mortals, Satan is going to have people to deceive. So we're going to have this Gog and Magog. Jesus is going to do away with them. Okay. And there's even talked about Ezekiel having to deal with the dead bodies and all these things. And I'm going to read Isaiah 66 shortly. Then we're going to have this resurrection of damnation. Okay. The white throne judgment. Okay. Now, when I was reading in Isaiah 34, it sounds as if God now is going to, I guess, strictly when it comes to placement, okay, you might say geography, is that now the lake of fire, which is Gehenna, okay, Jesus talked about a place that in English is hell, but the underlying word is Gehenna. Now, this is different from Hades because it's Hades that goes into the lake of fire, okay? And Jesus talked about Gehenna in such a way that you would be in your body. For example, in Mark 9. So you get raised up into damnation. Then you go to this place called Gehenna, which I believe is the lake of fire. This is at the end of Revelation 20. Now in Isaiah 34, it sounds as if the Lord is now preparing this place. And it's right there. Okay. And that's the interesting thing about Gehenna is that word comes from a Hebrew word, Kenam. And when you look that up, and I'm not going to do it in this video, but when you look that up in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, okay, and there's this place called Tophet, okay, this place was outside of the city of Jerusalem, okay? It was a literal place, okay? And it was understood to be a place that was not you know, a place that you really want to be, okay? And they did all sorts of wicked filth there. And you can read about it in the prophets. And there's this place that the prophet talks about, Tophet, that is ordained of old for the king it is prepared. 
and the mouth of the Lord does kindle it. I just paraphrased it, but it was prepared for Satan. And, but then all that follow Satan, follow him there. And so we started to get into this. Okay, there's mysterious aspects of this. So my, my understanding is this, is that Jesus, when he gets done with this, then cometh the end, the end of all this. This is what Paul meant. And this is delivered to the Father. The Father comes down. There is still going to be the presence of all these wicked sinners, okay? The white throne is inescapable, but also they're without the city. This is what it's taught by John as we get into just the last few verses of the Bible. They are without the city, okay? And the way it reads in Isaiah 34, if that is about the lake of fire, which I at this point, I believe it is because I don't think that would be talking about Hades. Hades is already established where it is. And that to me more sounds like now God on this earth is actually going to prepare to this place outside of the New Jerusalem for all these wicked people. And I'm going to read Isaiah 66. Okay. Isaiah 66 says here in verse 22 to start. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So, if they're without the city, and just the Isaiah 34 for me, it's very difficult to get around. I mean, it sounds as if, you know, like they're right there and all those foul animals. I mean, it's spoken of in a foul manner. And that's the reason some of those animals that were spoke of, it's representing demons, okay, and sinners, okay? And that's the thing is that like those animals, you don't want to be around them because of the devils. It's not that the animal is wrong of itself, okay, or wicked of itself. It's that the devils use them, okay? You know, it started with the, you know, the snake and all this, the serpent, and it's just moved down, and you're brought of vipers, and the men of God have used this type of language. But we know when Jesus reigns and all the devils are gone, Children won't even be scared of animals. They're going to lie down next to them. Okay? So you can see it's the presence of wicked devils that draw, you know, the fears of little children. Okay? And that the animals are just not, you know, at peace. Okay? Some animals are more peaceful than others. But you get some of these animals, they will kill you. Okay? Okay? And then this language, though, is used for judgment because it's understood by how we see things, with how the devils use the situation. And in Isaiah 34, it's just like they're there. They are there. They are there. Okay. And God has set up this place. Now, where is the lake of fire today? Is it somewhere, you know, is it somewhere that can move down onto the earth to where, you know, now it's just visible? And these are interesting questions, no doubt. Okay. But I happen to believe the Valley of Anam, which is outside of Jerusalem. Okay. And this is literally how it was. You know, we read about it in the Old Testament. I believe this is a great figure of how it will be in the new heavens and new earth and the new Jerusalem, which will come down and 
it's something that perhaps, you know, can be more detailed, of course. But again, one of the points of this video is you cannot escape reality, okay? The wicked will dwell somewhere. And just being around wicked people doesn't make you sin. You know, people say in this world is lots of sin. We're bombarded with sin. And okay, yeah, there's a lot of sin. And you can get bombarded with sin, but you don't have to say yes to it. And you can be that close to sinners and not sin. I mean, Abraham was talking to the rich man. It didn't make him sin. And all these different things that I spoke about, I mean, they shall be an abhorring to all flesh. Well, if you don't know that they're an abhorring right now, I don't think you have a very good job, very good chance to do this. Okay? I don't think there's a good chance for you to deal with this work. Okay? And it's just not for you. It's because you're going to be an abhorring to all flesh. And in your mind, you just know that and you know that well I just don't want to deal with this okay and well with God you have to go somewhere then okay so if you want to love the wicked and you want to be a friend of sinners you can be on their side you can be without the city for without the city are dogs and sorcerers and these people okay so God's not messing around, you know, I mean, God's serious about this, and today is the day of salvation, in Jesus' name.